Welcome to Marquee Backstage All Access. I'm your host, Julie Milam. Because of the tremendous success of our television broadcasts, we're thrilled to bring you the Marquee Backstage Podcast. Here we go more in depth into the lives and stories of our guests. We'll share exclusive content you didn't get to see on TV. Plus, you'll have full access to the five songs played by each artist, which were all recorded at Thunder Sound Studios. This week, we get up close and personal with Alabama native Jeremy Noble. Since his childhood, his musical style has been influenced by country legends like Hank Jr., Waylon, Willie, and Vern. To check out his personal style, here's Jeremy Noble with Angeline. Thank you. 
Jeremy, take me back to Alabama. Take me back to your childhood, you and your dad, bonding over country music. Yeah, we so we used to go. Uh, my dad had a, uh, a glass stream boat, and he used to fish a lot of tournaments, and then he'd fish during the week, and, uh, or he'd fish at afternoons during the week because he worked uh, at a prison during the week, so he was always home late. But when summer come along, we were out. We'd, he'd take us go fishing, so... I mean, I just remember getting in the truck and he'd listen to all kinds of stuff. He had Hank Jr. and uh, I'd burn Gosden and all the good stuff. And we listened to that a lot. Uh, and that's what I kind of, he started taking us to concerts and stuff. And I loved it. I lo I, I had a fun, I, had, I think, I don't remember my sister going as much. She went, but I don't remember her going as much, being as into it. Um, I, she's like six years older than me, so she wasn't too into it but i was i loved it i loved everything about it i loved the lights I it's a loved, whole new world oh yeah i mean i'm walking around with cotton balls in my ears because it, you know because i guess back then we thought that was going to help me <laughs> keep hey my at least hearing. you looked out for your hearing <laughs> yeah uh but we did all kinds of stuff like that it was always something that um he was into music all his life i mean he's he's a drummer he was a drummer in high school. He was the got in a band that played VFWs, and um, you know. And then he kept going and kept going, and then he got the real job. After he left the real job, then he had a chance to play uh, here in play in Nashville and uh, and play with some guys, and he loved it. I mean, it was just something that finally got him. I think to him, it was like the thing. I that was the pinnacle. Getting, yeah, finally getting to do what I wanted. Finally getting to do this. I wanted to do this. Years ago, but now I'm having fun, just doing what I want to do. Nothing, no stress, no nothing. Just go out there and have fun. And how was that for you to be able to just listen to music with him and understand his love and appreciation of it? To going to live shows that were other people, and then finally seeing your own dad play. So, for me, taking me to the shows first. See, I never saw him play until I got older. And he started playing in Nashville, um, and I, I, because I never saw that he didn't go out and play, do anything like that, because he worked a lot and he fished and he went hunting and he, you know, That's the dad, that you was know. his thing that he did. And then when I found out that he, I knew he dr had was a drummer, I knew he played, but I never saw him play. He didn't talk about it. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, he we had drum, drum on things at he home. Had a, we had drum kit until I was maybe seven or eight, and then he got sold it and got rid of it, but just because we, <laughs> we needed a room in the house and <laughs> didn't need, we didn't have no room for drums. But uh, him taking me to shows and stuff and listening and stuff, like I, I found myself at a young age with a little radio in my room listening to the stuff that he was listening to. As a kid, I didn't realize, you know, some of this stuff is not their stuff, their re recording something that someone else wrote and uh but i thought they wrote the song but with uh hank jr it was different i knew that a lot of stuff was his daddy's okay i knew which ones were his daddy's because i'd heard those versions right but i i got interested and got really in love with the fact that oh my gosh the way he sings this and tells this story and and waylon was i love i like then I find out later in life that he's doing a lot of Billy Joe Shaver songs, you know, and I'm, it's very interesting. Johnny Cash, well, he's doing Chris Christopherson song. Right. He's doing that, you know, so I, it, that was my thing. And then I kind of got into that a little bit as I got old. I didn't get into that point until I was older. I'm like, hey, I can write and maybe write something for somebody else. So. But you never wanted the spotlight for yourself originally. <laughs> You've never talked to anyone in my family before then. <laughs> <laughs> I would make up songs. Uh, I made up I made up lines. I made up stuff all the time. Like, i just come barreling through the living room, and I'd stop in the living room and go, hey, you got to let the black cat hop, and then I'd run out. I made up a song about a sock, and I would sing it. And, uh, I mean, it was, and I, the only words was the sock. That's the only words to it, and I just kept repeating them. Uh, and Entertainer I, of the year. I mean, all the time. <laughs> I entertained wherever. Then I got in school, and and I got in trouble because I no. wanted to be the, I, you know, 
I wanted to be funny, and then I hated school, so I never wanted to be there. And then I got into middle school and started singing in choir, and that's when I started learning how to cultivate what I was doing and do something a little different. Uh, and that's when I kind of, but then also that's when my voice started changing. And I started realizing, you know, I'm singing a little high stuff, but then it's uh, then all of a sudden my teacher's like, you got to start singing a little lower, you know. Um, but I always tried to, to be that, you know, I always wanted to sing, so I sang in middle school. And then uh, I tried out at eighth grade year, the big thing was show choir. Mm-hmm. You had to try out to get in, and only 12, six guys, six girls, that's it. But you could still be in choir, which was anybody got in. Right. But you wanted to be in was, the elite. Group. This was the thing that you did, and so I tried out, uh, and I made it, and I was like, okay, uh, maybe I can, maybe I can sing, and then got into high school, and then you had to try out for the, you actually had to try out for choir in high school. Well, then you had to get invited to that ensemble, and I got invited to be in that ensemble. So I was just started getting things, you know, and that got me going, and then get out of that and a little ego, yeah, a little strut down the hallway. Oh yeah, I go to college, go to college, and I've got, uh, I, I went in to for a quote you know, for a acapella choir scholarship, got a scholarship, got put in the show band. And then that, I, you know, once I left there, I went to theater. <laughs> Love the spotlight. Uh, yeah, I got, I'd always, <laughs> always. And now you can't get enough. Right. And that, and I blame that all on my dad letting me listen to Hank Williams Jr. and watch Hank Williams Jr. Because if you could, t- oh. I mean, Hank's, yeah. he's, he, even now he's, look at me, I'm here. So I'm. He commands your attention. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to do because I wanted everybody to know that I'm there. Oh, you do. <laughs> there is no doubt. So the day that you decided to leave Alabama, strike out on your own, as the entertainer, as the Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> that you wanted to be. Right. What do you think went through your dad's mind, your mom's mind that day? My dad thought it was going to happen way sooner than it did. Okay, so he, he was ready. He thought it was going. He didn't think I was going to go to college. He thought I was going to go right out of high school and go move to Nashville and get a job at Opryland, uh, or move to Atlanta and get a job at Six Flags, performing in their shows. In the parks, yes. And um, when that didn't happen, and I went to college, I don't, I don't know really what he thought about that, but I know that I know that's what he did think that was going to happen. Um, Do you remember looking at your mom that day that you pulled out of the drive? Oh, yeah. Uh, my mom didn't want me to. So I got a job here in Nashville. And I just remember when I left that first time, uh, it was, I'll, I'll give you anything you want if you'll just come back. And I just, but I think she finally saw, it took a couple of years. It took her seeing me play mm-hmm. before, she decided, before she realized, okay, this is what he's going to do. And I just, I have to, I have to deal with it. This so, is your gift. If I feel good at the end of the day about what I did, if I go out and play a show and I feel like everybody enjoyed it and somebody like, I just did a show and guy brought his kids and they're, and he's coming up to me going, Hey, where can I find, I want to follow you on social media and I want to, Hey, where's that at? And, you know, and. I, and then at the end of the night, they're letting me stay at their house, and then the kids are like, "Oh my gosh, you're that was so good today." You're famous. And I'm like, "That's that's, I've got okay. Then I'm I'm okay at the end of the day. If I go in and nobody's talking about it and nobody's doing <laughs> nothing, then I'm not doing what I need to be doing." Well, you are. There is only one Jeremy Noble. Yes, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> So we 
That was Jeremy Noble with Walk You Home. Make sure to follow us on social media at Marquee Backstage. You'll be able to keep up with all the behind-the-scenes videos and photos of our weekly guests. Now let's get back to more Jeremy Noble as he opens up about the meaning of trust and collaborating on new music with friends. And you don't want to miss a performance of one of our favorite songs, Backseat of a Van. In order to put your career in the hands of other people, to bring them along on this journey, there has to be a lot of trust involved. Oh yeah, um, like, and that comes from me being like, talking, saying things to one another. You know, I actually have tested people before and told somebody, hey, I'm gonna say something about you to this person and I'm gonna see if this person says something back to you. And they did. Um, you know, when I talk to somebody and ask them to play with me or something like that and tell them we'll do it for this much money, this is how I'm going to do it, you know, if they come back questioning it, then they didn't trust me. So I don't want to work with them again. I don't want to need them to come in because they're doubting me. They're not believing I'm staying true to my word. So I feel like they're not going to stay true to their word because they just have it in that may be one of these type of people that are trying to think that everybody's out to get them, you know, that type of deal. But uh, trust with me comes when someone uh, t takes the time to spend time with me. I mean, the more time we spend together, the more trust I get with people. And uh, I, I've got friends, I'm really close friends, but I have a small, like, brotherhood of friends in Nashville. Uh, a couple of them are from Alabama, so there's that connection. And me and one guy, me and Justin Johnson, knew each other before I came to Nashville. Uh, he, as a matter of fact, that was the first time I ever sung on a stage in a bar was with him uh, back in like 2001. And so that was really weird. And then we kept a kind of a little friendship going along the way. And when I came here, he took me in and he is the one that if I had to say I had a mentor, Justin would be my mentor because he's the one that, you know, okay, you're doing this and that's good, but try not to do this. Try not to do that. And so then I have little specklings of that from others in that group that took me in that kind of said, you know what, hey, do you want to get together and write? Hey, do you want to do this? You know, because you could tell when somebody trusts you if they asked you, hey, do you want to come join us on the right? Right. Because that means they trust that you are capable of coming and putting together a sentence. Bringing value to the project. Yes. So when you and Justin write, what is your favorite song you and Justin have written together? 
Uh, me and Justin wrote, have written one song. One song? We have only written one song, and we have not even cut it. Really? We haven't done anything with it. Just because, um, I don't know, we're just, it's a process. And when you were doing something in the process with somebody you trust, you realize that you trust each other when, you say, when the other says, there's something not here. Let's shelve it, let's think about it, and then we'll get back to it. And so we have one that we kind of have that with, and but we're still we're You're protective. Now we're now we're all guns a blazing, and we're about to start going again. We're about to get going. So some of the songs you sing, he wrote. Yeah, um, and he trusts me with those. That's that. That's that trust. He trusts that it, when I perform those live that I'm not going to go out and butcher them, that I'm not going to go out and change them, that I'm not going to go out and tell everybody, hey, listen to this song I wrote. Right. And, it, you know, it's his song. So, What is we your have, favorite song of his that you perform? Backseat of a Van is because it's real, mm -hmm. and I know how it was written. I've heard the story a hundred times, told to other people, but told to me like 50. And I love hearing it every time because it's, 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 it's the inside. It's what people see. It's really what's going on. I mean, it talks about uh, in the first line. It says, uh, "Smells like a feels like a smoke to pack," and then a, and then another. And I've walked out. I don't smoke. You know, that's one thing I always, thankfully, stayed away from vice wise, and because I always thought it's gonna. Brett Butler, the Dodger as a kid, kept me from smoking or using tobacco, chewing, because of that. then they announced he had that mouth cancer, and I was right. like, oh, don't want that. Don't Good. want to do that. But uh, but to listen to that and hear that song and feel like I've smoked a pack of cigarettes and then another, I've had that plenty of times, and then spend a, you know, get in the car the next week and, all my, and I forget that I've left my stuff, gear in the car, and open the door and just be like, oh. Smells like I just walked out. It smells like a, a just <laughs> ashtray in here, you know. So I I relate to that song because I spent nights in the back seat of a van riding down an interstate, and when you hit every bump in the road, it makes me think about driving into New Orleans every time because they had a ten was the worst thing. It was like driving up ramps, and you just when you go down through there, and uh, I just remember getting knocked out of a seat one time. And hitting my head and just thinking, oh my gosh. But I love it. I do it. I would do it every time. It's I'd the say, life you lead. I love it because I like waking up in another city. I love waking up and being in different places. I love seeing things. They laugh at me and they make, you know, we they joke around, you know, of like, well, Jeremy's got 17 things on his checklist to tour and see while he's here in this city. <laughs> well, we've only done two. You know, and <laughs> we've got a lot to do. Yeah, and I'm like, I like seeing things that I've never seen. Why, why go, why tour the country? Why go play in different places? Why play in Chicago and not go to a Cubs game? Why play in Chicago and not go downtown and find Chicago deep dish pizza from Chicago? Why not go to the, you know, play and go to Yellowstone? Go hiking, go do the things, go see the Grand Canyon, go to Vegas and go to the Hoover Dam. Why go do all that if you can't experience that? Because then you get to go back and you may be riding down the road and there you go. Hey, guys, song. I got an idea. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this? And then you got the other person thinking and you got another person thinking and then you have a song. Living the life of Jeremy Noble. Oh, yeah. It's hard. Because <laughs> sometimes I don't get out what I've... Sometimes I can't get it out in words what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. I, I, I stumble on some of that sometimes, and I need people like Justin and Waters and Tyler and Sean and Evan. I need those guys uh, to push me and make me, like, I hear Evan Lee's stuff, and I get so mad because I'm like, oh, my God, why <laughs> is he writing this good of a music? Because he has some of the I love the stuff he writes. And I sit back and I go, man, I wish I'd have wrote that. And that's that. I, I always, I'm prepared. If anybody ever asked me what song do you wish you, that you didn't write, you wish you wrote, I can pull one of his songs out and go like that one. 
and Justin's the same way. That one, you know. So, but it's but it being around them helped me out. They challenge you. You can't be creative in anything if you don't have people challenging you to be creative and step up what you're doing. There's like a Gatorade commercial now that JJ Watts in. He's like, find that person that's better than you, and find that rival because you're going to work to be better than that person, and that person's working to be better than you. Bird and Johnson, Alabama, Auburn, uh, Celtics, Lakers, you know, all of that, all that rivalry stuff in football and sports and stuff like that, you got to have that one person in the music that you go, oh, my gosh, oh, oh i got to do better than him. And, cause it, and you're not really jealous, you're not really mad, but you you know what you want. It's aspiration. Yeah, because I'm like that. I I make I've got goals that I want to do. I don't necessarily want to have our like a record deal, and it's weird. You want to do you. I want I want to go and play a show. If I sell my own CDs and music, then if people enjoy what I'm doing, I'm happy. And if I'm able to do it and make a living, I'm happy. Um, but there's the small things where, you know, you want to play the Gorge. You want to play Fillmore East. You want to play yeah. the Opry. Yeah. Even though the Opry changed and a lot of people don't feel. Still the Opry. It's still the Opry. That circle's still the same circle. And, you know, I have stood on that stage. I have stood in that circle, but not in the way that I wanted to. And... You know, there's still things that you want to do. Like, I wish I could go back in time and have Ralph Emerson interview me on TNN. You know, that's kind of stuff because I loved watching him. You know, I'd love to go back in time and do the old CBS specials with Waylon and Willie and Hank. And Would you have done Hee Haw? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I loved Hee Haw. I, I watched Hee Haw as a kid. I loved Hee Haw. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, then it was over and you Blue were gone. And, <laughs> and they did that and... <laughs> Uh, Grandpa Jones yeah. and all that. Many I pearls. loved all that. Yeah. Um, and that came from, you hear others talk about how they were, they were country. They were the reason why they did what they did. And you sit back and listen to it. And, I, I, you know, it's weird when you're in high school and you're listening to a song by Grandpa Jones, you know, or you're listening to old country and the guys that you hang out with are listening to whatever was current and whatever was going. But then I was listening to that stuff too. But then that's what turns whatever style I'm doing. Like we laugh, everybody, we talk about, people ask, well, what kind of music do you do? And we're just like, gruntry. <laughs> They're like, gruntry, because when it's full band, yeah, I've got that Pearl Jam mix of, that I loved. I loved Pearl Jam. I loved Nirvana. But I loved... Aerosmith, and I loved the Allman Brothers, and I loved all that stuff, and when you can mix all that and just make it a dirty, just have fun, rock out, and have a good time, but then slow down, uh, because Leonard Skinner could slow down is better than any of them, and do a good slow song, Simple Man, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then do a song like I know, I, I know a little, you know, it's there, it's you never what knew what to expect, and then go do a song that is just pure southern rock, hardcore. It's things like that. I loved the band. The band was a different. It was a every album was something different. Right. Every song was something different. So I don't. I don't think I have to stick to one thing. That's why we say country, because then it's got a little bit of mix of everything. I think we're going to have to start calling it Southern Country so that we can have the Southern rock, the grind in the country. There you go. <laughs> Continue to evolve. Oh, yeah. Bright lights have all gone to bed 
feel like I smoke a pack and another And my eyes are all swollen and red Yeah, my woman's been down for the evening I tell her I'll be home real soon I know she's tired of waiting But there's nothing that I Halls and dirty truck stops. Hear the echo alone in the journey. Like a finger in all my thoughts. But I wouldn't be here. I couldn't go there without this guitar. When you hit every bump in the road Just when you think it's the last time When it hits you right square in the nose But I've been doing back home What I'm doing here Playing this guitar with my hand It's a bitch to drive It's almost daylight I've been coming home when I can The back seat of a van We'd like to thank Thunder Sound Studios for letting us film our show from their fully equipped analog and digital recording studio complex in Franklin, Kentucky. For more information about Thunder Sound, please visit thundersound.com.
To watch Jeremy's televised episode and all other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Marquee Backstage. Now here's more with Jeremy Noble and his song, Leaving Tennessee. So you invest a lot of yourself into fellow musicians. Do you see a lot of yourself in some of these artists that are just starting out? Uh, no and yes. <laughs> What makes you want to help mentor other artists? Well, I do and I don't. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yes. <laughs> what it is is like, okay, so like we've had a lot of guys. There's, I, I know some guys that started. I've seen them start their band and, uh, you know, maybe grab a couple of them, pull them aside and say, hey, don't do that, you know. But um, I try to tell them just to get away from it go out and go hiking, walk through the woods, go out and do, um, go fishing, go hunting, go do this, go do that, and get away from it for a little bit and then come back. And then if you want to come back and do it with as much enthusiasm as you did before, then do it. And if that's it, then do it. That's the way it is, because that's what we do with uh, Rock and Roll Basement, just what Justin and Josh Waters did when they started it, was they brought guys in they brought guys in that they said, okay, you need a little help. You're good. This song you wrote's good, but let's sit down and just think about it for a minute. What would make it sound better? What would make it a better song? And, um, you know, uh, finding people that need help. Like, I don't have the money to produce this. I don't have the money to record this. I don't have the money. Well, you know, that's when Justin comes in and says, hey, we have the stuff. And let's, why don't you come over here and record? And so I got slowly brought into that part of the family and brought into that. And that's what we do now. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like a, I feel a real part of the rock and roll basement. And uh, to the point where I, I do a radio show in Alabama on Sundays and we call it rock and roll basement radio. I mean, that's how much trust comes back that he's brand, letting me brand the, the music back home back home with that name. Right. And that's another way I go to help is I have friends and they need their music heard and I play their music. I don't play anything. I'm on a rock station and everything you hear on my show is never heard on the radio station at all at any other time. Those two hours on, on that Sunday is when you hear Dave Finley or Dave Kennedy or Channing Wilson or, uh, you know, Lewis Bryce. Well, Lewis gets good airplay. He's a bad example of that. He, he gets out. He's, he's, getting, he's getting radio play. But, you know, some of the artists, like the Americana, the, the people that don't get, that don't have the billboard pushing them and don't have this and don't have that, the Tyler Childers of the world, the, Turnpike Troubadours, the Mike and the Moon Pies of the world, that type of stuff. And I play them because I play what I like and I feel like I like good music. And other people believe that you like good music. So they yes. follow you. They follow your show. Yes. And that's what makes the difference. Yeah. It, Everybody's standing behind one another. And it's, I don't, when I play somebody's music, I pay for their music because I feel like that's the way that it needs to be. Right. They get their money, they get paid. I buy that song, so I can put it on my show. And and if it's, you know, I know how hard it is to make money. I know I see how hard it is. I see how hard it is for artists that are out there selling out shows. That, you know, they may be getting a lot of that Spotify stream stuff, but they're not seeing anything from it. Right. And, you know. One T-shirt is worth a thousand streams. Right. And when you look at that and realize that somebody sells, you know, has so many streams up to a hundred thousand streams, and then you realize, oh, they only made like a hundred and two dollars off of that. Right. That's a that's a hundred and two dollars for. Just think about if they sold that song personally at their show, that one song for a dollar a piece. Mm -hmm. To everyone in the crowd and sold a hundred thousand they just made a hundred thousand dollars there's something wrong with uh there's something wrong with our with this industry 
when somebody walks away and they're not making the money off of the, something they wrote. And uh, I think that it's uh, if we don't get out there and support it and we don't get out there and fight, you know, because there's a saying out there, best song wins. Mm -hmm. And I think the best people win out in the end, too. We have to stick together. Oh, yeah. We got this. Uh, yeah, and that's why we do the rock and roll. But that's why we include everybody. That's why we partner with uh, the National Masquerade. That's why we partner with um, everything else that we do in Nashville. If we do a show with somebody, you know, it's 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 amazing when you have people reaching out, going, "Hey, does, would Rock and Roll Basement like to sponsor something and put you know, would you like to be a part of this and stuff?" So you know, songwriters nights and stuff like that and have a songwriters thing that we do at the distillery. Uh, Josh Waters and Mark Cardwell do. They they get out there on Sundays and they have a different, you know, a lot of us go over there and we play and we play for about three or four songs and we go out there and do it. And it's because we love the music and we love doing it and we love playing. So it's that's what we do. <laughs> Just a four-way stop in this little town That means there's four ways to burn it to the ground And she don't want to stay She's not part of that clique She don't put up with nothing No thrills, just feels, feels lost here, so in need. Can't take that drama no more from the homecoming queen. For all the latest on Jeremy's music and future shows, be sure to follow him on social media at Jeremy Noble Music. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Marquee Backstage. Next week, don't miss Australian native and live looping legend Carl Walkner on Marquee Backstage All Access. For his last performance, here's Jeremy Noble with Drinkin' Ain't the Problem. Until next time, I'm Julie Milam. I'll meet you here next week on Marquee Backstage All Access.
Watching you with him burns worse than whiskey going down. But that whiskey's all I got since you ain't around. Drink one to the memory, two more for the pain. By the time I'm through, I won't feel a thing. Cause drinking ain't the problem. You're leaving left a scar. All night long wandering Am I gonna go too far? This bourbon's got a hold on me Like you do on my heart Drinking ain't the problem, no But you are All I ever wanted Was to win your love Tried to be straight place, know my place, and all I do is mess up. Drinking ain't the problem. Cause you're leaving left a scar. All night long wondering, am I gonna go too far? This bourbon's got a hold on me, like you do on my heart. Drinking ain't the problem. This bourbon's got a hold on me Like you do on my heart Drinking ain't the problem, no But you are Drinking ain't the problem No, drinking ain't the problem Rah!